ESP, now it's time to add aviation. This supports the FAA next-gen requirements. Weather service being a single authoritative weather source, and what it would require is five national digital elements. And what we at the weather service offices can do is offer ceiling and visibility forecasts. Um, this will tie in very closely with enhanced short-term services that we all live, already do. And I guess it's been coined from headquarters as called enhanced digital services now. The FAA needs this because it requires, it satisfies the requirement for us to pre create routine tasks. But the Aviation Weather Center will also have a lot of use for aviation weather grids because they're just continuing their text. The gridded aviation will play right into it. But there's a widespread demand for this information for getting points of aviation weather forecast in between our regular task sites. Emergency medical services, search and rescue are big users of this. And also, the drone community is growing. Aside from general aviation, which we already know has been begging for this information for years. The big picture for all of this DOS initiative is consistency. We're going to have consistent products between our public products, such as the winds and what we're outputting in our tasks. And when we go to this, our, our users are noticing. Um, eventually, we're going to have consistency between our offices. That's always been desired by the aviation community. And we're going to be able to deliver by using aviation um, DOS services. All right, so for Central Region, what are we talking about here? What was installed into your offices recently? Well, you're going to have Consort. That's going to be available for aviation weather elements. The ones that we're talking about, these new elements, are called cloud-based primary, ceiling, visibility, low-level wind shear, and low-level wind shear height. What we did was we streamlined a lot of uh, QC tools into a population procedure and a finalized procedure. We have a slightly modified task formatter. Um, the formatter keeps improving and will continue to pass down improvements to you. But um, what you have is the latest. And what Jerry made was an observation grid. And, be, and after the obs grid, he was able to make gridded verification for these aviation weather elements. And I'll be showing you all of this in the upcoming presentation. So what does this mean for us forecasters? When you dig into the aviation weather element group in GFE, you're going to notice that you're going to have all your aviation relevant grids at your fingertips. What you really just need to worry about are two extra grids, cloud-based primary and visibility. Your ceiling is going to end up being a calculation of what you put in your sky cover grid and what your, what your cloud-based primary grid says. It's interesting to note that only your ceilings, or only uh, the values that have your sky cover greater than 60% are sent over to NDFD. The rest of your cloud-based primary stuff is read right into your TAF formatter. And then, of course, there's going to be QC checks between all your weather elements just to make sure we have a consistent and so scientifically sound picture. And then what you'll also get is a TAF formatter. At first glance, this looks like an overload of TAF lines. What I have found when using the TAF formatter is just that it's easier to remove lines than add lines. And so while this might look daunting, it's actually not too bad to edit in the AVN FPS before you send it. And bottom line, our TAFs are now consistent with our grids. If anything, it gives you a really good starting point where your wins are already loaded into your task lines for your task groups based on your winds and also your major ceiling changes. All right, so what is actually changing for us forecasters? 
Um, I'll get to that on the right-hand side, but first of all, what doesn't change? We're still using AVN FPS. We're already doing our hourly wind, sky, pop, and weather grids in our short term. We're already issuing tasks at regular times. We write tempo groups manually that you can still do. And we do amendments manually that you can still do. You're just basically simple changes. You're adding two new, two new editing groups. And you can make a tempo group from your grids if you really want. And here's, a, here's something good. The grids are now consistent with your tasks. What we have found here at Milwaukee Sullivan is that we're ending up with less hand editing, quicker. It's quicker to make tasks. And I'm actually getting my forecast done a little earlier in the shift. So, I'm, not, I'm going to go into these procedures just a little bit. Um, like I said, there's a lot of background procedures lumped into your aviation populate and your aviation finalize. While I'm going to touch on a couple of these, the real, the real guts of all this are documented in an installation document available in a CR DOS toolbox on a Google shared drive. And I'm going to be talking about that at the end of the presentation. If you go to your populate menu, you'll find that installed now, you will be able to see the aviation tools. The primary ones are loaded all at the top, um, all preceded by aviation. And you've heard me talking about populating with ConShort as a starting point. ConShort you already have for your normal um, weather variables, but now Jerry made it available for the aviation weather elements, cloud-based primary and visibility. The weighting is just a little bit different than your normal forecast grids, and you, it's just all laid out here in this slide, which will be available after this presentation as well and in the documentation. All right, so how are we going to be doing this? Let me tell you right now, this is not an overnight process. Um, we are all going to get into digital aviation services at different, at different pace. Every office is different. Every forecaster is different. And we recognize that. So we've kind of divided it up into steps. Um, with your whole office getting into the operational mindset of digital aviation services, if your office has already been doing it for a while, it's not going to take you long. If your office is just now looking at DOS grids for the first time, it could take you up to a year to adapt this process, and that's perfectly OK. Becoming operational with DOS is a central region fiscal year 2017 goal. But anyway, for, for step one, say your office just loaded this in on January 22nd, and you're just going to go into your GFE now and look at it. What I encourage you to do is look at the model data. Look through point by point. And when you're generating your tasks and you want to see which models are saying there's going to be low ceilings and which models are not, you'd want to step through your GFE and um, pick out and just see what the models are saying. You're going to find that early on in this process, it's going to start helping you generate your tasks. Whether or not you're using the grids, making edits to the grids, using the formatter, anything, just looking through the models is going to help. Um, ConShort is populated into the background for your cloud-based primary and your visibility grids, your forecast grids, when you're in step one and step two as an office. It's just run in the background. It's put in there for you. Um, and a little more on that in a minute. OK, so after you've been using your model, looking at the models passively, what I'd like you to try is loading up your tasks into Avian FPS from what was generated in the task formatter. Try using this as a starting point sometime. You'll find that your wind groups wind change groups have already been kind of parsed out, along with some ceiling changes. Um, after you've been trying this for a while, and a lot of people in your office are doing this for a while, what you can do is go through your local office team lot process and 
as a whole office, if you decide, okay, we're ready to start experimenting with DOS officially, what you can do is go into experimental mode. I want to back up one second. In step two, if you want to make changes to your, your forecast grids, to what Constort put in there, and then run the task formatter, you can. Just know that every six hours it's going to be overwritten because of the script that's running in the background to populate Constort. Anyway, when your office decides to get into step three, experimental mode, what you'll be able to do is run AVH and populate manually. Now, there is still a check built in so that a banner will pop up. If you haven't edited your grids in the last five and a half hours, it's going to, a banner will say, hey, I'm going to populate con short if you don't want to edit anything right now. And you can just let it run if you want, or you should run your aviation populate manually. Then what you can do is decide, hey, where can I add value to con short? Make your edits and then you run Aviation Finalize. That applies all your QC tools. And uh, you can publish your grids if you'd like. You run the task formatter, you pull it up in Avian FPS, and you can make edits and send. So that's a very active approach when you're transitioning into digital aviation services. And the end goal for fiscal year 17 in Central Region is that we're all operational where we're routinely making grids, saving, publishing them. They go to the um, NDFD and point and click. You're running your task formatter, making edits to, to them in IAVN FPS, and then sending. So that's our end goal. None of this is required yet, but just, just to map out where we're going with this. A lot of forecasters in our office have had very positive comments. Other forecasters in other offices I've heard recently have great reviews as well. I've, the overall positive of using digital aviation services is tremendously more than the negatives. All right, and this might be what it would look like in NDFD. We send our grids out, and we can look, pull it up in the hourly graphical forecast. This was a case where we had valley fog. Um, here's an, a picture of what the hourly weather graph would look like. And then for a case during a snow event, say we're looking at Milwaukee here along the lake at the point of 10 p.m., you can see that we're having ceilings lowering from west to east and visibility is lowering from west to east as the snow moves in. If I just take the point at 10 p.m. on the hourly weather graph, this will show users the trend we are expecting with the ceiling and visibility over the next several hours. All right, what about collaboration? I'm sure that is burning question in the back of your mind. The Central Region Grid Methodology and Advisory Team, they've been tasked to develop these some thresholds and guidelines for collaboration. That'll happen over the next year. And having this common starting point where we're all starting with con short is going to be a good thing for several reasons. Um, first of all, just as we do in the extended, it's going to make it easier to collaborate future changes we make. Um, collaboration with our neighbors will, will be important at some time. For now, we just want you to focus on your TAF sites. Sites in between, that will come with practice, and it will get easier with time. One more, one more really positive thing about having a common starting point is it sets us up as a region for being ready for what, what changes might come in the future. There's been talk about starting with the National Blender model. This will set us up for that if that happens. There's been talk about the Aviation Weather Center grid, making initial aviation grids for us. If that happens, this will set us up for that. But for now, we're using ConShort as our common starting point. All right, so when you're making your tasks, first of all, first and foremost, make sure your other grids are updated. Get your sky cover up to date. You're going to want to pay attention to the percentages because we have a cutoff of scattered category sky versus broken at 61%. Make sure your winds are up to date. Your pops you're going to want to pay attention to as well because for greater than 46% pops, then that would be mentioned into your task as VCSH. Um, and 
there are some other pop rules for prevailing thunderstorms, et cetera. Your weather type should be determined ahead of time, but just know that there's some tools in aviation finalized that will help get your um, weather in, in line with your visibility. All right, and what you're going to need to know is how to use your TAF formatter. There's a lot of rules that go into it. It's, it doesn't actually all the time take your, your ceilings that you put in and visibilities. It doesn't take it literally all the time. So uh, you'll have to do some editing after you run it in AVN FPS, and that's okay. Just get to know the TAF formatter. If it were to take into consideration every single change you put in your TAF formatter or in your grid, you'd probably end up with 20 line TAF. So it has to have some background shortening algorithms. Um, and then what you want to focus on is writing your TAFs and your grids by flight category, not exactly what you're going to be seeing in the METARs. And you'll just need to practice, see how it goes. What you'll notice is there's three blank grids that are loaded into your aviation weather elements. They can stay blank. These are optional. Um, that cloud-based secondary can be used to put in some lower scattered group if you have like a broken ceiling, if you want something lower. Down one level of coverage, that'll work. Your conditional groups are actually made to create tempo groups. This part is still a little experimental in the task formatter. It'll only give you a one-hour tempo group at this time. And look for improvements on that to come. GSD is working on those. And with that, we're going to pause and have time for about maybe two questions, and then I'm going to keep going for getting into the tools. Brian, you want to take over from here? Sure. Um, I, uh, I have had a few folks with question marks, um, uh, and I've been trying to chat them uh, throughout. Uh, what I'll ask is people to raise their hand, and I will unmute you if you have a question. I have one raised hand. Cami, I've, un I've unmuted your line. I'm, I'm good, Brian. I don't know why it was raised, but I'm good. Thank you. Anyone else? We have very many shy people, but also folks who, uh, uh, I guess, want us to uh, move along on to the next. Oh, maybe there is one hand. There we go. Jim, Jim Pringle, do you have a question? Oh, uh, this is Julian Grand Junction. Um, yes. I had a question about, I saw that we would have to have at least 46% pops for VCSH or VCTS to show up in the TAP. I was wondering if that's adjustable um, at all or if you're taking feedback on that. Um, yes, Julie, that is, well, what we did was we just held over what Boston had set already when we kept that, and that's what they had decided. Is it adjustable? Yeah. Um, we, you can adjust it per office, but know that that would be overwritten with updates. Um, and what we're do looking for is actually some feedback. That question has already been brought up very recently. Like, why did you choose 46%? Um, I didn't choose it. But if, if we want that changed, we can, you know, we're looking for feedback on that, too. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess we were thinking here with summertime convection, um, our pops tend to be typically a lot lower, you know, or closer to 30%. Um, and we'd be putting vicinity showers in our taps. Um, in that case, because you know it's mountainous terrain, so it is going to be low probability, but could still happen. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, and uh, I thought I saw um, a hand up from Matt, but I'm going to go to um, uh, Pueblo. Pueblo, are you are you uh, ready? Oh, Pueblo, I can't turn you on. I don't believe you put in your uh, audio pin. So you should see that here in a moment. Put that in, and then you will be unmuted. Uh, 
and sorry for our call in uh, our dial in line uh, folks you do have to put in a uh, audio pin for me to activate you okay well we may come back to uh, to Pueblo um, and I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, Marcia, if you'd like to go ahead. Yes, I'll move into what our GSE tools are and how to edit some grids. What I want you to think about when you're looking at your grids and what you have put in there for con short is where can we improve upon con short? There are times con short works and other times it just doesn't get it. All right, so let's say this is what one of my con short grids looks like for cloud-based primary. If I would want to change it, I can do one of many, many, many things. We're all like expert grid editing people as forecasters. So we're just going to use our basic grid editing skills to modify the cloud-based primary forecast grid. One thing we could do is copy another model that we like better into the forecast grid. We could use the select area tool. We could use some sort of blend of models tool. We call it a scalar vector tool here. You can use the pencil tool if you feel like you need to. Another thing I like to do if we're expecting improving conditions um, or vice versa, I would delete some intermittent grids and edit just some key ones and interpolate later. The aviation finalized procedure can interpolate these grids. One thing I want to point out here is that say on a diurnal cumulus day, you're worried about where you're going to have those 5,000 foot ceilings versus maybe scattered 5,000 feet. Remember your cloud, your, your sky grid is the thing that determines coverage, not your cloud-based primary. So you really, you could set the whole grid of cloud-based primary to say 5,000 feet and you'd be good because your sky cover determines your coverage. All right, so there's a couple rules or little background procedures that are wrapped into the populate and finalize procedures, especially the finalized one. They're in the documentation, but I wanted to go through it graphically. All right, so the ceiling from cloud-based primary and sky. What this does in this example is in the top left, I have a sky grid, and the, the southwest area of it is less than 61%. My cloud-based height grid has some, has some values in here, but when this tool runs in the background, it sets your ceiling grid, not your cloud-based height grid, but your ceiling grid, the thing that goes to NDFD, to negative 30,000. Don't be afraid of that number. It's just some arbitrary value that defines a non-ceiling in NDFD. It actually has nothing to do with your height. You can have 15,000-foot ceilings, um, it just has to do with your sky coverage. All right, so another rule, QC visibility with pop and weather. Say your pops are less than 55% in the southwest corner of this image. Your visibility, you have some speckles of statue miles in there where your pops are less than 55%. All right, now look at your weather grids. You just have chance of snow and it's less than 55% for POPs. You don't have any fog or haze in there. So what the, this tool will do is kind of do a QC check here, and it says if your POPs are less than 55%, you're not confident enough for any kind of precip to mention in the task formatter, and so then you, you would have your visibility would automatically get set to seven statute miles after this QC tool. Now, if you had snow and fog, in like patchy fog in here, then it would keep your visibility in, in your visibility grid. It would keep that lower visibility just because it would show BR in your task formatter. OK, I need to say, though, when you're in step one and step two of this transition process where aviation populate and finalize are running in the background, we actually just turned off this tool. 
And that's so that you can actually see the low visibilities that are in there, even if your weather group doesn't support it. I also need to tell you, though, when you run your task formatter, there's another check built in where it can't give you a low visibility with no weather restriction. So if you don't have fog in your grid, your weather grid, but you have low visibility, your task formatter is still not going to show that low visibility. Moving on. Ceiling from cloud-based primary and sky. All right, here's a QC check for where your pops are greater than 55%. Let's say you have pretty high ceilings in there for your cloud-based primary. When, you run, when this tool is run and finalized, where you have high ceilings, it actually sets it down to 9,000 feet where you have high pops. It's basically QCing and saying your ceilings can't be that high if you're thinking there's going to be likely precipitation. All right, and then what you'll notice when after finalized runs, it's going to clean up your cloud-based primary groups and put it into kind of even numbered values. So you might have your you might have a ceiling grid that's between 600 and 1,000 feet. When you run finalized, it would be set to 700. It's still within that aviation flight category. It's just rounded so that the task formatter knows what to work with. There's a similar tool that's run with the visibility. All right, so now let's say you make your visibility weather grids or your visibility grids, and you're using Consort as a guidance or you have other ideas. You make that grid, and now you would like to use that grid to determine what your fog is. There's this aviation fog from visibility tool. It's actually built into Finalize but you can run it separately if you want. And I, I adjusted in this screen capture differently from what is defaulted. But anyway, it's kind of my personal preference. But this is how I put in patchy fog using this tool based on my visibility. Why is this important? You have to have some kind of fog mentioned. If you're going to have a reduction in visibility, even if it's five miles, if you want it to show up in your task, if you want BR in your task, like 5SM BR, it has to be in your public weather grid of patchy fog or areas of fog. Any, any fog coverage will make BR or FG in your task formatter depending on your visibility. All right, here's a, here's a useful tool. This is to run outside of, of po aviation populate and aviation finalize called cloud-based primary from RH. Consort does not do well on diurnal cumulus days or convective days in the middle of summer. Consort does really well with IFR, MVFR days. But on those days that Consort is not doing well, you're going to have to do some manual intervention. So this is a great tool for diurnal cumulus. You know how you're looking in buff kit for what your cloud bases would be? Well, this kind of does it for you on a gridded basis. You can choose which model you'd like, you think is representative. You can adjust your relative humidity sensitivity with the slider bar at the bottom, and then you run the tool, and it will come up with your cloud base. And remember, that's for an aerial coverage based on the model. Your sky coverage will determine if it's scattered or broken in your task. All right, and let's go through a little example case with showers and isolated thunderstorms here in southern Wisconsin. First of all, I just want to touch on the rules for thunderstorms in your tasks. In the short term, if you have higher confidence with your thunderstorms, you'll get that prevailing thunderstorm in your, in your task formatter. And this is also included in documentation, so I won't spend any more time right here. All right, so we had convection rolling through southern Wisconsin from west to east. And on the back side of the convection, the ceilings and visibilities were getting pretty low. So I guess the question as a forecaster is, OK, how low are they going to get? And what is the timing on that? When are they coming down? And when will they be improving? Well, if I'm forecasting and I want to see how Consort is doing in the, in the relatively short term, 
I'm looking at the Consort cloud-based primary forecast. In this instance, it's 6Z. The forecaster here, um, in this case, in the bottom right, made some edits. What he decided was that western areas should have a lower ceiling than what Consort was giving him. So he was able to blend it with adjusted labs. This is after knowing which models were doing what he wanted and which ones weren't. Um, that helps give him some lower ceilings. Similarly with visibility, he saw that the visibility should probably be lower along the lake than what Consort was giving him. So he was able to blend it with G lamps, maybe use a pencil tool a little bit, and get that to what he wanted. Um, most of our edits occur in the first six hours of the TAF period. The, um, the outer periods, we kind of let Consort take over. And I'll show you later, verification does pretty well in those instances. All right, another procedure is low-level wind shear. That's included in your grids, but we oftentimes just don't have to deal with it. Low-level wind shear occurs um, in good low-level jet cases and other, you know, minor instances, but you as a forecaster already kind of have an idea of when you need to keep it in mind for having it in your forecast. Consort will do okay at picking up on it, but that's if all the models are in agreement that it's the consensus is going into. There is an outside of aviation populate tool called low level wind shear that you can just pick your model in order to generate low level wind shear. Here's an example. You can see it's kind of spotty over our area. And so when when we're taking a look at this, we might want to say, oh, well, I've looked at buff kit, I've looked at forecast models, and I think it's going to be everywhere, and I think the value is going to be just a little higher than what Contour gave me. Here's where you could use your pickup value tool um, to just make it representative of what you want. Same with the low-level wind shear height. And of course, you would do this for the time, the time period that you're expecting low-level wind shear, and then that'll get picked up into your task formatter. All right, the before picture is up top. That's your, your task formatter. This is what low-level wind shear would look like. Again, it's a little bit wordy. The forecaster chose to pare it down a little bit before sending. OK, I'm going to take one more break before we just get into another example case and verification and wrap things up. Are there any more short questions? And then uh, we'll keep going. Brian? Yes, um, yes. I want to see if uh, Pueblo made it back on the call. Yes, we're here. Can you hear us? We can. Go ahead. Awesome. OK, my question is kind of on the first section there. Um, you had a tool that allowed you to ask what weather element should visibility modify intensity. I didn't see any check boxes there for blowing dust or blowing snow, which has been a frequent occurrence out here. Um, and there are other smart tools as well that seem to have uh, lack some logic that might help better in mountainous terrain. Is anybody working on improving these tools or adding these capabilities? Hi, this is Marcia again. I'll answer your question. Um, this is the type of feedback we're looking for. Um, as you might imagine, we just don't deal with blowing dust and blowing snow as often in southern Wisconsin. The thing is, Jerry and Denny and I are more than happy to expand these tools in order to match, ca match capabilities that you guys are requesting. So short answer, yeah, we would love to help you with these tools. And that's why we're getting into this feedback process. So thanks for your suggestion. Um, just another observation. Um, out here in the mountainous terrain where your observation points are really far apart, uh, we noticed that the OBS uh, grids as well as the con short grids for your cloud-based primary and visibility can just be awful. I mean, the, it might be a boundary layer moisture issue. Sometimes the mountains are, the con short and the OBS are indicating that there's ceilings, IFR, LIFR everywhere, and in fact there's clear skies. Um, and it's not every grid either. It'll pop in randomly here and there. And con short seems to pick up on it and try to forecast it into the future. It usually dissipates pretty quickly. I really don't know what's going on with that. Um, and then there are other times where it's just trying to take the OBS 
between a valley with a mountain range on either side, and it, it blurs that ceiling or that visibility across a 100-mile area, which in reality it's just confined to this small little valley. Um, and it could be patchy, dense fog even. Um, it's, it's just a lot of challenges out here in mountainous terrain. I, I don't foresee this being a, a quick process in modifying these grids to make them even look like what's really going on, much less forecasting them out six hours. Probably some logic uh, needs to be added to these martinets to get them a little better, and, and then we'll be there. But it, it's, it's not plug and play yet out here. Just kind of wanted to throw that out there. OK, yeah, thank you. And I'm going to let Jerry weigh in on that here. Well, it, it's this exact feedback why we really wanted to get this out to everybody so that we could see a lot of these grids. I mean, MKX is only good as what MKX is. We can't see how it's performing everywhere else. So by this kind of feedback, that's exactly what I need as a developer to try to improve it. With that said, I mean, some of it is it's only as good as what the models in going into Consort are saying. I think the specific example that you're talking about may be related um, actually to the OBS database because there is a function in Consort that um, includes what's going on in the OBS database. So by you saying that it sort of it includes it and then dissipates it fairly quick, um, my guess is that could be some of uh, some of the OBS influence. Um, but the idea here is we are going to be starting up a VLAB account and that VLAB account will be able to accept different images and whatnot that you guys might be able to generate and, and ship to us so that we can improve this. Um, we definitely want this to be open-ended and allow you guys to provide us the much needed feedback we need to make it a better product. Yeah, that sounds good. I like it. Okay, and we do have to be respectful of time. Um, I have one more question. I'm hoping we can make it short. Um, it also comes from uh, uh, from the high country. Um, Scott, are you available? I'm unmuting your phone. Yeah, this is Scott here in Boulder. I just had a question on the low-level wind shear. I know it's all model generated. Has there been a thought about using any of the VAD wind profiles on generating some of that uh, initialization for the uh, low-level wind shear? No, right now we don't have any ops grids for low-level wind shear. Um, it, it was something I thought of, but um, that analysis is going to be a tough one. Um, definitely something if you want to work with me on or work with a group of people on, I'm, I'm really I'm for that. Um, I think that would definitely be beneficial in the early hours. Um, but right now, yeah, the, the low-level wind shear is 100% a blend of the RUC-13, NAM-12, and GFS. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, try and start working on that. Okay. Um, uh, I do actually see one more hand, but maybe we'll save that for the next break. Go ahead. All right. Here's the last leg of the presentation. All right, so uh, there are a lot of models out there, even short-term models, and of course they all have varying solutions. How do we pick which one? Well, that's the idea of ConShort. We have a consensus of the short-term models weighted on how they overall have for verification statistics. We pay attention to that. Um, here is one example. At one time, one in, out in the forecast, I'm looking at five different models with five different model solutions. All of these are fed into ConShort. Uh, all of some of these, they have different weights here. But anyway, you can see by the colors that define where the aviation categories are. Some are showing IFR moving into the CWA at zero V. Some are keeping it VFR at that time. And this was a case where snow was going to be moving into the area and bringing down our ceilings. All right, here's four more models for the same time. Again, a range of IFR forecast to VFR. These are all fed into ConShort as well. And then these four are not fed into ConShort. Their verification is a little bit worse, but they're still in our weather element group to take a look at. Um, they tend to be a little more binary, where you've got VLIFR versus VFR right away. But anyway, 
There's a wide variation of solutions. Con short is for that forecast time period was in the bottom left panel. And this was the person generating the 18Z tax, making about a six hour forecast. Um, Cloud-based primary, what their forecast ended up being was a little more pessimistic than what Con short was giving them. Turned out to be kind of the right the right idea because in the OBS grid, minus this little weird OB back here, it's kind of a bad OB. You can see that there was IFR category right right off the bat with the precip spreading into the area. So going a little more pessimistic than what Con Short had in this case was the right decision by the forecaster. All right, I'm moving into another example. We had a mixed precipitation event. We had a front end genetical band that set up over southern Wisconsin, it brought accumulating sleet and even some thunder snow. We ended up with a wide range of accumulations with rain and sleet being the primary precipitation type in our south along the Illinois border. And snow, of course, up north, and we had 10 to 12 inches in our northern tier of counties. Of note, uh, we had a forecast of four inches in Milwaukee and they ended up with nine at their airport. We had some rogue mesoscale uh, vortex up going up Lake Michigan and spreading a snow band right across downtown Milwaukee. So yeah, that went well with our forecast. Anyway, here's how the radar showed right in the early part of the event. This was noon on December 28th. Light, light uh, sleet and snow had already, actually this was all snow at this time, light snow had already spread in and it was moving northward with time. But at 18Z, um, we kind of can evaluate how Con Short did and how the forecaster did when they were writing their 12Z task. Um, Con Short was saying mainly IFR, maybe or maybe MVFR, little IFR, the forecaster went a little more pessimistic than what Con Short had written, and that turned out to be a, a good idea because the OBS grid was showing mainly IFR ceilings at that time. A little later in the event, this is when a lot of the sleet was occurring, and then of course the heavy snow band over the northern part of our forecast area at uh, zero Z on the 29th. Um, Cloud-based primary and the forecast were pretty, or come short, and the forecast ended up being pretty similar, meaning the forecaster had a lot of faith in con short. This was actually farther out in the forecast cycle. I took an early forecast, did 12Z task, but valid for 0Z. That's what we kind of encourage doing. Stick with con short in the extended part of your task and uh, add value in the short term. Well. Consort ended up being a little bit too pessimistic for what was going on at zero Z. Um, it's mainly a little bit higher ceilings in the OBS grid. Same thing, valid at zero Z, but for during the 18 Z TAF issuance, Consort was backing off on those low ceilings. Turns out to be a good decision. Now we can run our TAF verification for that for just uh, December 28th using stats on demand. That gave us a probability of detection of um, 0.758, not too bad. But what, what we did, Jerry came up with gridded verification. A little bit more on that in a minute. But in this instance, for this one day, December 28th, forecasters ranked first out of all the guidance. That means that we added value over what Con Short was giving us and other models. I, the real models that we were verified against in this case are in the red blocks. Um, Jerry has also been throwing in some experimental models into our short-term verification. And uh, so those are here too, but a little bit discounted. All right, this leads us into the verification section of this presentation. Well, TAF verification is an important aspect to evaluating how we're doing and where we're going. Um, we've only been on, with DAS for one year at MKX, but our verification is showing that we're moving in the right direction. 
One thing I, I want to point out that's been called to my attention recently and why it's important to, like when you're doing task verification, probably consider doing over a long time range, is Matt Lawrenson, he's MIC at Green Bay, he made this graph for us and it's showing blatantly that the higher IFR frequency we have, the better our task verification. So we, what he is working on is making IFR normalized plots for individual offices. And I think he'll be presenting a little more on that in the future, so watch for that. All right, so now for an example, we're going to take a light snow event across southern Wisconsin and check out the R4 TAF sites, overlay that onto the OBS grid, um, Jerry's OBS grid that we're verifying all of our models and our forecast grids with or against. Um, just to show you, it's actually really representative of what's going on. The so METAR said 1,700 foot overcast in Madison, and that's what the OBS grid said. There was a slight variation, but still the same flight category at Waukesha. The correct, or just again, same thing at Milwaukee, and then we had broken 700 ceiling at, at Kenosha. Uh, the OBS database, or the OBS grid, captured the METAR observations very well. The way he makes it is he not only inputs the, the ASOS and AWAS observations into it, but he has it overlaid with kind of a blend of short-term models, especially the RAP, and he runs that in the background just to make a more widespread picture in his verification OBS grid. Then what he did was he set up a verification web page. Now this is available for everyone in Central Region now. You guys can go to your verification web page and find it. You'll have a, a tab now or a word said aviation verification. You can click on that and get your office's individual verification. Right now, your forecast, if it's running in the background automatically, your forecast would be the same as con short, but you can see by different uh, selections up here at the top for time range and what you want to verify, um, you can select that and find out how you're, how you're doing and how the models are doing. There is a way to, to uh, peep in and see what other offices are doing across Central Region. You can click on CRG mat verification to find out what everybody else is doing. When you scroll down in this page, you'll find contingency tables available as well. For more information on this, consult our documentation and other PowerPoint presentations. Okay, overall, Jeff Craven ran eight months' worth of statistics for Milwaukee Sullivan. This was after we had been established with Digital Aviation Services for quite some time. What we found is that over a long period of time, our forecast grids in our short term ranked first over Consort. What that is telling us is Consort is a great first guess, but we forecasters have actually learned where Consort does well and where it doesn't, so we've found places to improve upon Consort, and that's reflected here in the verification. So the forecasters are adding value, and that is exactly what we want to see. Um, just running the equitable threat score for the same time period, it points out that the con short was able to outperform us forecasters in the outer period of the task for IFR category. And that's also important to note. Con short might be onto something. It might know a little bit more than some of us forecasters. So just uh, keep that in mind and, and ways to evaluate your own verification as you get more established in doing DOS at your office. All right, so in summary, I encourage you all to give digital aviation services a try in your office. Remember, it's not required right now, but I really encourage you to start looking at it. It's showing strong verification. It, it is easier to generate tasks this way, and it's promoting consistency, which has been touted from the top down for years. We, we are seeking your input and your feedback. 
on this. We want to keep improving this process, and we're going to keep sending out improvements as they come and as they're made. But this gets us into the Central Region Fiscal Year 17 goal as of now. Um, it's just to do digital aviation services routinely, sending your ceiling and visibility grids to NDFD and point and click, and running your tasks from your task formatter. All right, so we have this Central Region DAS toolbox. It'll look something like this, and we're sending out a link to you by the end of this week. Um, when you have the DOS toolbox in your fingertips, you will be able to get five separate and like parsed out presentations. If I went through every one of them, it would take me like five hours. So I tried to condense it into one. You're going to find a lot of these slides are mixed into the other presentations in here, but there's going to be more information. There's also a lot of written information in this CR DOS install intro. And well, as Jerry noted, a VLAB account has been set up for Central Region DOS, and this will serve as a centralized location to put your suggestions, comments, questions, that all of us can go to one, all of us developers can go to one place and help address your questions. That said, Brian Hirsch is the regional aviation focal point, and he can direct your questions to the appropriate people as well. And as always, Jerry and I are both available to contact as well. One more thing that's going to be in your Central Region DOS toolbox is this uh, two-sided one-pager made by Patrick Eide in Bismarck. He did a really great job summing up the main procedure of running DOS at your office, what each procedure does, and on the back side it gives your thresholds for your ceilings and tops make it into your task formatter, and a lot of helpful tidbits. So I encourage you to go here and grab it off and keep a copy in your ops area. And with that, I will wrap this up and let you go. We'll answer questions and let you guys get back to your normal forecasting duties. Thank you very much for your attention, though. We appreciate it. OK, well, thank you, Marcia. We do have just a couple of questions. Um, uh, Cheyenne. Are you with me? I've unmuted your line. Okay, I tried to chat Cheyenne on their question. Um, not hearing from Cheyenne, I'll move to uh, Jonathan. I've unmuted your line. Jonathan. Hey. Hey, this is John in St. Louis. Uh, we're, we are, uh, experimenting with uh, digital aviation grids right now and um, had a couple of instances where Forecaster has uh, done some work on the uh, on the grids and then the aviation uh, prepare script runs and it wipes everything out. Uh, this actually happened to me today. Uh, I loaded in Consort and didn't like it so I went back and loaded in some other model data and made some tweaks. Uh, luckily it w they weren't huge tweaks that I had to make to the other data uh, and I was able to you know recreate it but uh, right there at 1640 that script ran and uh, needless to say I was displeased. Uh, is there a uh, something that we should be doing about um, you know saving and I, mean, I had those grids saved but I hadn't published them or anything like that yet. Do we, is there a step that I'm missing here to make sure that those grids don't get wiped out at 1640 or at, at 40 20 till the hour. So this is actually part of the process. I mean, the the initial install has basically no checks in it for whether or not grids have been touched or not. Because um, this was, the idea was we're just trying to get grids populated so a task can be created. The, at the point at which your office thinks they're going to be doing lots of grid editing and um, looking at the grids a lot more, at that point, that's more along the experimental time frame. And at that point, you would need to actually create uh, or rerun the install script and say you're, it, it's sort of, it, it, the way I wrote the install script, it, it makes it sound like you're doing it operationally. Um, but you would, it, there's a 
section of questions that you'll have to answer that yes, you are doing this operationally. And what it'll do is it'll install um, what's called aviation check, not aviation check test. And that, that check tool, it will actually search through and see if you've um, done any grid editing. And if you have, it won't do anything to the grids. My understanding is that we we've done that. Uh, that's what Tom told me anyway, uh, our GFE focal point, that it, it should be doing that check test. Not, we don't want it to do the check test. In your situation, we would rather it just do the check. Um, it's two different codes. Um, so just, just get your ITO or uh, focal point to get in contact with me, and I can definitely help you guys out so that doesn't happen. Because it sounds to me like you're more along to the experimental phase of this. Yeah, we, we've got about, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to get some procedures down for the rest of the staff. We've got about four of us doing it uh, on a regular basis now. Uh, so we're just, like I say, in the experimental stage. Right, yeah. So I think if you, you just get your ITO or GFE focal point with me, I can definitely help you guys. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, thanks, John. And uh, four is a real promising number already. Um, I did want to uh, provide a bit of a shout out to the uh, uh, Grand Island Hastings office. Uh, uh, they are moving along that way, and I believe that they will become operational um, uh, uh, here at the end of the month or so. Um, and uh, Scott, did you have another call? Or did you have another question for us? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I noticed uh, when um, the con short, when that runs, with it, especially with the ceiling, there's a, a like a three-hour gap um, between the initialization or that, you know, the present hour and like three hours ahead. So there's, you know, from like say 15 feet this morning, yeah, there was a there was a grid, and then there was nothing in there till 19 Z. Now I noticed sometimes those hour gaps change. I'm not sure if there's a reason for that or not. Was that the automated run, or was that aviation populate? Uh, that's the automated run, and I think that's being done in the background. Are you a mountain? Are you a mountain site? Yes. Okay. Um, that could be a bug. Uh, definitely shoot me an email after this just to alert me of it, and I have something. Um, I'd like to work with your office on that. Okay, sure, we'll do that. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's Scott at uh, at Boulder, and thank you for that. Um. Jackson, I see you have your hand raised. Um, I am attempting, there we go, it looks like you're unmuted. Um, is that Ed? Go ahead. Yes, we had a question. We're not running the automatic uh, population procedure in the background, but we were curious, does that have to be run in order to see the verification stats for the con short? What has to happen to see the verification stats, at least for the forecast database, and that's going to drive a lot of the verification itself, um, is you have to have your forecast database populated for um, cloud-based primary visibility. So that, that was the idea of doing the automatic population, was to get your forecast database populated. You should still be able to see con short type verification, um, but if your forecast database is 100% missing, I believe there's an actual a check in the, the web script that may prevent that. Um, so the idea there was just to give the grid something as well as the task something. That's why the um, auto-populate was turned on. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now we have just a few more questions. We are just past the top of the hour. Um, if you have to leave us, the main presentation is over. I do want to thank everyone, but uh, uh, with um, uh, with Marsha's permission, uh, Jerry's permission, we'll go ahead. Uh, we have about three more um, questions on the line. Would that be appropriate if we if we continued, and we'll just let folks drop if they must? Yeah, we're here. We're yeah. here as long as we need. As long as we need to be here, we'll be here. Okay. Well, John, I see you at uh, um, 
not at Grand Rapids, I don't believe. Uh, John uh, Kowalski, let me uh, let me unmute your line. Okay, Jason. John, are you available? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, this is Jason in Indianapolis, calling or here, and uh, just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about philosophy and procedures, perhaps when you get into a situation when a sauces are giving you highly changeable. Uh, observations over short periods of time and how you handle that and what is the approach? Are you talking about like when you're in the meat of the situation and things are coming down really fast and you're trying to keep up with your grid? Well, a, a little bit of that. Uh, not only keep, just uh, how, I guess I would say how uh, going through the procedures that you would go through in a situation where you might have to do a lot of rapid updates uh, or, or TAF amendments in, in this case. Uh, I, I amend manually. I'm getting some uh, observations that are jumping back and forth between two different categories and so, and so on. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could talk about how you deal with that and the procedures that you go through to, to, to deal with it. Okay, I'm going to address your question here. What we do in a rapidly changing situation is we amend manually. What, what this whole process is for, so what the focus is right now until we all get really good at DOS grids, is to, make, to use DOS grids for your routine forecast packages. In rapidly situations, let's face it, you're not going to have time to make your grids look exactly the way you want. It doesn't have the capability to do tempo groups at this time as well as you would want them. Just get into AV and SPS and amend as necessary. That is the advice for the short, the very, very short-term variability. Does that answer your question? Yep, that does. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, Jerry here from Cheyenne. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Uh, we're kind of behind the power curve here. We haven't even started aviation grids yet. Um, but it seems like the HRRR out here does a lot better uh, forecasting uh, ceilings and visibilities. Is there a way that maybe the uh, mountain offices for the con short uh, to have some influence with the with H triple R in it? Well, right now the H triple R does contain um, actually a pretty decent amount of the weight. If you look at H triple R and the experimental version of it, it's about four times the weight if you combine the two of them. Um, so there is already a pretty substantial weight to it. Um, the, it has been, I have been thinking about, and you know, one reason why I'm personally excited about getting a lot of mountain offices involved into looking at these grids is to see if it will pay off to do the same sort of thing we're doing with the extended process, which is to change the weights of the models depending on if you're in the mountains or not in the mountains. Um, those are all things that I, I personally would like to see answered with, you know, this initial period with people looking at these grids. Um, it's definitely going to pay off, I think, for us to look at the verification. Um, the verification, you know, we can look at it gridded or we can look at it how it's verifying specifically at the TAP site. So um, while this is a gridded process, we can still look at um, points at which we trust a little bit more. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something that isn't set in stone. These weights are not, I mean, I'm always looking to improve the process. And you know, frankly here, there was a time frame where I almost wanted to drop the HR completely because it was performing terribly. Um, but then it picked it back up again. And you know, a lot of it's just regime dependent on how well the HR really is performing. Um, same can be said for the wrap. 
um, that thing can get hit or miss and can start just performing like a lame duck. Um, so I, I just, you know, the, the weights are a tough thing, but I'm really excited about getting all the sites looking at this because we can really start narrowing down these weights. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, Pete Rogers. Peter Rogers. Oh, and I have unmuted your line, but you will have to enter your PIN. Next up, how about Aaron Johnson? Aaron, you're you're on. Hey, how's it going, Brian? Very good. What is your question today? Okay. Well, just a quick one. You know, I've read about uh, increasing the temporal resolution up to 15 minutes. How close are we to having these aviation grids at 15 minutes to, to match things like the HER? I, I don't know. Can you answer that? I, I, I may be able to answer that for us all. Uh, Jerry? <laughs> um, I'm sort of chuckling because, you know, I, I think that's quite a ways out. I know there are some models that have that resolution, but to be able to do that in AWIPS, whew, um, that, that's going to be pretty substantial. And even to allow, you know, the bandwidth issue of bringing in that kind of resolution, um, I think we have a, lot, a long way to go to get, you know, to get to that resolution. Believe me, I would love to see it. I think, it, you know, it looked pretty neat to see, but... Um, I think we're a few years, if not more, away from that. Yeah, that's similar to, to, to what I was about to say, is that I know that the FAA has asked us to look at that kind of sub-hourly um, uh, uh, kind of input, um, and we have uh, uh, nationally headquarters has looked at that. Um, it, it hasn't. Um, it's it's not something that we're likely to do anytime soon. Uh, we're limited by architecture, but uh, but there are also other other issues there. Um, good question, Aaron. Anything else? Nope, that'll do it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Pete, it looks like you've entered your your pin. Can you um, uh, can you hear us? And can you go ahead now? Yeah, it's not Peter, but it's uh, Dan Baumgart in Lacrosse. And oh, um, my question is for, um, well, I guess it's a bigger picture item here. And and Marsha and, and Jerry, we've we've raised this to you, but I guess I wanted to pose it to Brian uh, to get a little bit bigger picture item idea on how we're going to move forward on this. Um, one of the one of the things that we have to kind of work through at least is, is how we handle inconsistencies with impact for aviation and public uh, when we're using one grid and, and, and that inconsistency, an example of that comes to mind in, the, in, in that we have to have fog in our grid for all visibilities uh, for aviation community for, for those visibilities to show up in our TAF and our text TAFs. Um, but we might not put fog in uh, the weather grid for the public for three, let's say three to five mile fog. Usually what we do is, is, is put fog in our, in our grids when it's like less than a mile because there's really no impact to the public. So we have this inconsistency we're dealing with and so what's going to happen is we're going to end up issuing a lot more forecasts with fog in them uh, even though the, the public will really not even recognize that there's fog out there. So I guess moving forward, is there some thought being given to that, or um, I guess what's the bigger picture idea, Brian, from from a standpoint on how to move forward um, with those types of inconsistencies? No, that's that's understand understood and being addressed. Um, Marsha, would you like to uh, um, provide some comment? Um, yeah, uh, this is this has been brought up before, as Dan said, and I won't deny it. I know in the past we've put fog in the grids for about a mile or less. That would be more of the public realm of fog. There is not a way around this at this time, and uh, this is something we could bring up with the national development team for DOTS and kind of 
maybe as a large group team, figure out a way to work with this in the future. Well, and, and also where I thought we were going with this, and, and we also have uh, um, Cami uh, on the line to speak with us as well, but um, uh, there is, um, um, we, we are looking at uh, splitting out the, the, um, uh, the visibility group and uh, creating some some flexibility that that isn't isn't there just now so okay so this is likely to change I guess is what yes. I'm hearing. The, there'll be quite a uh, quite a lot of uh, changes and improvements as we start to move into this um, Currently, right now, why would we change anything since there's only a handful of offices doing this? But as we start to um, uh, get uh, over a dozen offices doing these kinds of things, then you start to look at you know, whether we need to um, uh, think differently about how these grids are going to be used. Um, and again, the grids are what's important. It's it's nice that they also help us do the TAFs, um, but um, the grids and the way Jerry has it populating right now provide you a look at Consort and, a, and an ability to um, see where everything's verified. And, and I, I really think that that's a very important step here. Uh, I know that the, um, the great effort people will go through to uh, see what the latest Canadian says, uh, <laughs> whether or not that's really what we need to follow right now. Uh, they're just excited to have that additional data. Um, being able to see how all this is verifying should be exciting additional data. And as we do that and we get more people on there, we're going to find new uses and, and new challenges. And, and, and uh, uh, as I said, the, the grid splitting is already uh, uh, being discussed and, and uh, uh, moving forward. Um, we are... Uh, we're about uh, uh, a quarter past. Um, what I'd like to do is um, uh, find some folks who have not yet asked a question on the call. And then I'll go back to, um, looks like I'll go back to Pueblo. Your question. Was it Julie? Hey Brian, uh, this is Ben here now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But my, yeah, our question is, I posed it there in the window. Also, is the task formatter only looking at a single grid point for each airport, or is it looking at a certain radius around that airport to come up with the the forecast? That's somewhat dependent on the edit area you chose and are linking to in the task formatter. So. That, that's something that each office set up on their own. Um, it can look at, you know, an average over a group of grids or like we have it set up here, um, which is just a grid point over the, the, the TAP site. Um, personally, that's the way I would set it up. Um, but, you know, some offices may have a different idea about that. Okay, that's great to have that flexibility because I know certain task sites we have up in the mountains, it'll be nice for it to be considering some of the, the higher pops that might be on, you know, associated with the, the higher terrain around the airport to put in the vicinity remarks in the task. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, you know, I think that would be a point of which it, though you can change the edit area grids on the fly, um, so you know just change them to see what they look like and see what kind of task it provides, and then if you don't like it, then change them and see you know just play with it. I think that's part of this process here is that there's like Marsha said in the talk, there's a lot of things that are configurable at the site level for the site to to sort of play with when it comes to the task format. The grid's not not as much, but you know the task formatter definitely has some flexibility built into it to make it um, more realistic for the individual sites. That's great to hear. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Grand Junction. Um, I see, Aaron, did you have a question again? Yeah, I did. Uh, a quick one here. The, uh, both the wrap and the HER, the, the upgrade they're supposed to undergo here in 
next few months, whatever. Both will go out uh, farther in time. I believe the herd is supposed to go out to 18 hours and the wrap 24. I assume, Jerry, that the uh, the composition there I see of the con short, you will account for that when, when those upgrades occur? Yeah, that will sort of be, a lot of that's automatic. Um, so con short, the way it looks for things is whatever's available it uses. So if it um, ends up going, like the wrap ends up going out to the 24 hours, then it will use the wrap out to 24 hours and that will be a good thing. Um, it'll improve pretty much all the elements just because it'll give us, you know, more of a smoother transition. You won't see that big gap at the 18-hour time frame that sometimes you can see with ConShort. Um, so, yeah, I, I always look forward to those upgrades. That's actually why I included the experimental HER in there is because that does go out to the 18 hours right now. Um, so once the live version or once that experimental version becomes the version that we see over the SBN, um, you know, we may remove the current experimental version and change the weight back. Um, we'll see how that all pans out. Um, but yeah, that's something that is always a changeable thing in ConShort. Thank you. Okay. And um, next up, we have um, a new question from uh, Mike. Mike, you're unmuted. Yeah, this is uh, Mike from Des Moines. I just had a one quick question. Um, in regards to the, uh, the actual formatter in GFE, one thing we've noticed is that it still tends to, at times, uh, give you very similar lines. Uh, Jerry and Marsha, I know you mentioned that you can easily remove lines or delete lines, but it seems like it gives you really no category change and, and maybe even the wind speeds a lot of times less than 12 knots. Um, there may not even be a 30 degree difference. So I'm wondering if there's something we need to configure with that. And then we also notice there's something that has, it says truncate TAF um, if required or something along those lines. Does that actually do anything or is that in there for something in the future? Uh, thanks. All right, the TAF formatter. It is definitely its own beast. Um, it was developed by offices out east. GSD took hold of it and kind of made it better for national uh, consumption. And so what we did was we passed out to you guys what we had from the national point of view. It has imperfections. That truncate option was actually a kind of a holdover from some older version of that. And I believe that the national team said that might be removed in future builds. Um, as far as it giving you too many similar lines, I have noticed the same thing. I have We've played with adjusting the sensitivity of winds and stuff like that. Um, I don't have a good solution. Some days it gives me a lot of lines, and sometimes it doesn't even give me enough lines. It doesn't give me the right break points occasionally, where I say, hey, I thought the ceilings were going to come down earlier than what was in the TAF formatter. So you just have to keep an eye on it. Um, we're, conti we're continuing to work with the national level to improve it. So any kind of feedback you have for that TAF formatter, send them along to the VLAB or myself, Jerry, and Brian. We'll make sure we get these. Problem, but it's not going to be a quick solution. And I would like to speak okay, to that. I appreciate the feedback. Thanks. I would like to speak to that. Hey, Mike, um, uh, and anyone on the call, um, AVN FPS uh, is. Uh, uh, is probably one of the, other than the AWIPS climate, is one of the oldest things we have out there that we use on such a continuous basis and is so important to us. Um, for about a year, we've been talking about uh, what it would take to have a 2.0. There are critical errors in AVN FPS. Um, so if any of you out there feel as though you are an AVN FPS expert, uh, and would like to give a, a whack at uh, uh, at what I'm calling 2.0 or the 100,000 mile um, uh, overhaul. Uh, please go ahead and send me a uh, uh, an email, or better yet, just give me a call um, at any point this week would be good. 
and uh, we'll we'll start uh, we'll start down the the path of improving that. Um, and so that's my plug. That's not digital aviation. Let's get back to digital digital aviation. We have one last question and then a comment um, to close us out. Um, uh, Patrick, are you available? I've just unmuted your line. Okay, thank you, Brian. Not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, just uh, giving you. Uh, I know Jerry's had a little bit of track on this from us, but we've been experiencing quite a bit with uh, time lag uh, grids, time lag ensembles, creating a lot of those in-house. So uh, multiple runs, like we're doing the Contour TL, and then you know not only looking across multiple runs, but also forwards and backwards one hour. And so you know, we're we're definitely going to provide you know Jerry and uh, and all the, the key players here updates on how that that's verifying where we. Uh, not just using one one run of the or one hour of the con short or one run of the con short for multiple hours, and for a select number of the elements, maybe it's more advantageous to also look forwards and backwards an hour into that averaging. So we're we're just to let everyone know we're we're taking a peek at that here. We're you know, in the past six months we've been pretty heavy in trying to leverage time lags uh, on an in-house basis until we can get them. Uh, more uh, accessible uh, from the greater model guidance sources. So that's something we're taking a peek at here is not just a single uh, single run of any blend or model, but you know, trying to incorporate the, the time lag into hopefully capture trends and maybe that gets fed into the TAP format or possibly reduces some of the lines um, if we can smooth out the overall trends. Uh, so just, just a quick comment of what we're doing here and that uh, you know, we'll be uh, sending the feedback up, up the chain as well, what we find out. Thank you very much, Patrick. That sounds very interesting. And make sure you keep Jerry in the loop. He'll be in. Yeah, and my, my, what you saw there with the time lake stuff and the verification, that, that all does use multiple versions of the model, plus it goes, um, like, like you were saying, an hour ahead and an hour behind. Um, and I use different weightings based on which hour it is. Um, it's something like you, you're doing there, you're testing it, we're testing it here. Um, I'm sure at some point we should get together and you know see how our versions of the co of whatever we're doing um, are similar. So and then you know from there maybe see what the grid methodology team thinks. Um, you know it, there are times when I like the time light grids, there are times where I think they're not as nice. Um, I, I loved the idea of the con short TL. Um, the, the interesting thing there is I was actually thinking of concluding some of the time lag grids in con short, so then you're sort of, you know, in, <laughs> it's like a second order derivative type thing. I don't know, it, it, that gets sort of interesting, but it's a very good idea, Patrick, we, and, I, and I like it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I know we sent you an email a couple of days ago just to kind of give you an update on what we're doing so we don't want to reinvent the wheel or, or be... Uh, uh, duplicating any effort uh, in, in any ways that we're all maintaining kind of consistency and running it through you guys in the CRG map to, to kind of that proper chain of innovation. So um, we appreciate Jerry, and I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, as we move forward. Yeah, and I did get that email, and I, I was I was on leave the last couple of days, so I just hadn't gotten well, we back know you to got it. a lot on your plate. No <laughs> worries on our end. <laughs> all right, thank you. So Brian, do you have any other questions for us? Okay, well, thank you. Um, I've unmuted Cami's line. I don't know, Cami, if you're available for uh, final comments as we close out. Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, really, really great conversation, guys. I'm really appreciative of all of the really good questions you all have and and the feedback that you're providing. Um, I know it was brought up a couple of times about the mountainous areas, um, and that's something that we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from the national perspective. I was on some conference calls last week with Western Region, and only a couple of offices have really started down this road of testing it out. And so we don't have a lot of testing under our belt for the mountain areas. We know that some of the things may have to change um, to work for you guys, but we need your feedback and your input to do that. 
one thing I noticed too is in, in the slides, you know, Marsha puts in there um, some flexibility of, you know, implementing digital aviation services at your office. Sometimes you'll take two steps forward and one step back. And that's no different here from what I've heard from some of the offices. We have about 15 offices who are operationally doing digital aviation services across the country. So what you guys are doing in Central Region is, is huge. It's a big step forward. But keep in mind sometimes um, if you have big weather events or big snowstorms or big severe weather or whatever it has, whatever you have and you're kind of early in your digital aviation, you know, give yourself some leeway. Sometimes you will take steps back and don't be discouraged in that. It's, it's happened at numerous offices from what I've heard from people. Um, I also mentioned was the task form matter. And that is something that GSD, we have funded and our aviation services branch has funded GSD to and improve upon the task form matter. It should be uh, de developed and maintained at a national level, not at a local level. So that's why we've kind of taken it over. Um, your feedback is imperative to moving this forward. Um, I know a lot of times I've been in three WSOs and things get busy and you just do things as you need to to get the forecast out the door. Your feedback here is, is huge. Like I said, we have 15 offices who are doing this nationally. So fixing it locally doesn't help you get it fixed for good. <laughs> so I'll just throw that little uh, tidbit in there. And the, as far as I tend to mention, it doesn't, it, it's not doing it properly right now. That's something that they expect to have fixed in the new build that's going to come out late February. I believe in Central Region, from when they pulled the formatter, development, it, there's actually some new things in it now that you guys don't have, and there's another version coming down the road in February. It is a new project, lots of testing and lots of changes going on, lots of smartness going into the formatters right now. So expect a lot of development in the next six months and improvements to the task formatter. But please don't, don't be shy with your feedback and your questions because all of this helps the overall health of the project. And then the last plug that I'll provide is we do have a digital aviation services user group. We have an email group, and then we also have uh, digital aviation services user group meetings that meet every other week on Tuesday afternoons. So if you want to be a part of the user group or the meetings, please just shoot me an email and I can add you to the list. And it's kind of like an internal list server for digital aviation services where you can post questions or um, feedback and so forth. You guys in Central Region are all doing the con short doesn't necessarily mean other regions are doing that. Some of the regions have their own projects moving forward, but for sure the task for matter and so forth, you can ask questions and you can kind of get a feel for what other regions are doing too. So if you want to be a part of those user groups, let me know and I can get you at it. Again, really great call, great feedback, great conversation. Please keep it going and um, good luck with the testing. Thanks, Marsha and Brian. Okay, well, um, thank you, uh, Jerry and Marsha, for all your um, preparation for today. Um, this isn't the end. There'll be a hundred more questions after we get off the phone as you all get into this, and that's okay. That's where that's where we're uh, we're at. Um, we'll for now we have everything on the Google Docs uh, for uh, all of you. We are, we'll be trying to move this to a VLab. Um, site. Uh, hopefully we've applied for it. Hopefully it will be set up soon. Um, and uh, as a reminder to uh, er anyone who may have other people working on this for tomorrow, um, for whatever reason the scheduler allowed us to double schedule. I think it would work to record tomorrow, but we're not sure. So what we did was we asked folks to um, uh, to schedule themselves or to sign up for a new uh, uh, for a, a new set of numbers. So that uh, that information is out there, and, and I've bolded that. So our next call is January 27th, tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, between 2 and 3 p.m. Um, today on the call we had as many as 43, and uh, I know we're going to pick up um, uh, several tomorrow. So uh, between between the two days we should have uh, most of Central Region covered. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap the call. Uh, any final comments from uh, Marsha or Jerry? Uh, 